can start. Allah. Thank you very much, uh, Hun, for the introduction. Thanks a lot uh, again for this, uh, for giving me the opportunity to give this lecture. So let me uh, remind you of uh, what we are doing. So we are trying to construct infinite uh, equilibrium configuration of points. So infinitely many points living in the whole space, which are at equilibrium with respect to some interaction. And the interaction we consider is always the Coulomb or Ries interaction, which means essentially one over the distance to the power S. So I've spent quite a bit of time explaining to you uh, the short range case, namely when uh, the interaction is integrable at infinity, so when it decays fast, if you like. So that's exactly when S is strictly larger than the dimension. And now today we will finally uh, uh, describe what's happening in the case of the long range interaction, namely when S is less than D. Okay, so let me remind you uh, of what I explained to you last time that when S is less than D, you just can't take a domain and optimize the positions of the points in the domain and then enlarge the domain because the points, they hate each other so much due to the repulsive long range interaction that they will all gather at the boundary and you will just get almost nothing in the middle of your domain. And what we want is to find an infinite uh, or extremely large, if you like, equilibrium position for this point. So this is just not working. So what was working for S bigger than D is not working at all for S less than D. And this one can also see by looking at the minimal energy of these points, which uh, grows faster than N and uh, with a coefficient which only depends on the shape of omega. So what we will do now is uh, what I've started to explain last time. So we are going to force the point to live inside of omega by applying so, some force to them. And so there are several ways of doing it. You could add an external potential and so on. Here I will discuss the, the, the unique homogeneous way of doing it in the sense that it will satisfy all the scaling relations that we had before. So uh, if I scale the domain by a factor of lambda, everything will scale the same way to respect the scaling of our interaction. And so the scaling invariant way of doing it is by adding what's called a uniform background of an opposite charge. This certainly has uh, an important physical uh, meaning because uh, it describes uh, some, uh, some charged particles which ev evolve in a charged background of opposite charge, as you can find in the core of some stars, for instance. Uh, but uh, the, 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 the main message is that this method, which physically is usually only used for charges, actually works for any S, which might be a little bit of a surprise that it works for very small S, but it does. So what's the mathematical uh, formulation? It's the following. So we replace the pure uh, two-point interaction, which is the first sum here. Okay, let me remind you of what Vs is. Where is Vs? Whoops. I guess I have to go to page three or something. Show you again what Vs is, sorry. So here is Vs, let me remind you. Okay, so it is one over the distance to the power S when S is positive. At zero, we take minus log, which is the first non-trivial term when you do a Taylor expansion in S. And then when S is negative, we flip the sign. Okay, we put a minus. And let me remind you that this was to have some good property of the Fourier transform. That's the reason why we flip the sign. Okay, so Vs is now this potential. So I'm, now I'm writing Vs because when S is negative, there's a sign. When S is zero, there is a log. And what we do is we add uh, this background. Okay, so it means that the points, they will feel this external potential here. So you sum here over the positions of the points. And then this term is the interaction between each point and the uniform background, which I chose to have density rho b, b like background. Okay. This is an external potential, which is applied to the points. And now it's convenient to add a constant. This is a constant. It doesn't do anything to the, the optimal positions, which is just the energy of the background. Okay, the Vries energy of the background. It's natural to take it into account. 
So now we have these uh, three terms. They will all be very big, right? Because we know the first term will typically be very big. And so we hope that there will be some compensations, okay? You see the sum of a pair is a little bit like a one half. Here I have a one half, here I have a minus one. So I got two one half minus one. There should be some compensation. But of course, the danger now is that we have this huge negative term and this huge positive term. And so we have to check that the energy, the minimal energy is now of the order of the volume as we want. And we think that some of the density of the background Ruby has to be chosen so as to cancel something. And so we will have uh, uh, to take rho b to be the density of points. So we will have to take rho b equal to n over the volume. Okay, it's, it's clear that this is something we have to do. Okay. However, when S is positive, it's going to be automatic. We won't have to impose it. It will just be uh, true automatically. Otherwise, the energy will be too high. But when S is zero or negative, it's something we have to impose and that's related to this uh, Fourier transform having a finite part, okay? So the first thing we do is to check that there is a lower bound on the energy and then we will check that there is an upper bound. Upper bound, we have to place the points in some way and compute and lower bound, we have to do a proof. It's usually much uh, more complicated and that's why I'm starting with the lower bound. So the lemma says that the energy is always bounded from below by a constant times n, the number of points, okay? And by the way, when s is negative, the energy is just uh, positive, okay? Um, as a lower bound. So you see that as a lower bound, at least, we don't get this uh, very fast power of n. Now you might say, Okay, but before the energy was very large, but it was positive. And now we give a lower bound, which is negative. It's a little bit strange. But let me emphasize that when S is positive, the minimal energy will turn out to be negative. Okay, that's due to this uh, second term. Okay, so this is the, the fact that the background is uh, working well, if you like, for all values of S in all dimensions until minus two. So how does the proof go? I'm not going to discuss S equal to zero. I'm also not going to discuss S negative. S negative is easy. I can explain it to you very quickly. So I'm going to explain S positive. And the proof uh, is as follows. So that's the, the general idea. So let me, by scaling, assume that Ruby is one, okay? So the idea is to split your potential into a positive part which decays fast, okay? and another part which decays slowly, but is continuous everywhere and has positive Fourier transform. So let me remind you that our potential V is positive and has positive Fourier transform. However, it diverges at the origin, which is a problem for my proof. So what I will do, I want to somehow only retain the, the, the very positive part at the origin, okay, which is integrable, but which blows up. This I call W1. And then I also want to retain the long range at infinity. And I want to uh, keep the fact that it's positive definite. So the Fourier transform is positive. So let me write V as W1 plus W2, where W1 is positive and integrable. And W2 is continuous, so it doesn't blow up at the origin and has a positive Fourier transform. Okay, I claim I can always do that. And now, how do I bound my energy? So of course, let me show you again the energy. The energy is linear in the potential, right? So then I get two terms. I have the energy with W1, the energy with W2. So for W1, I'm going to only keep the negative term for a lower bound. And for W2, I will keep all the terms. So how do I do? So for W1, I keep only the negative term, which is this one. And then since W1 is integrable now, I can just uh, replace this integral by the integral over the whole space. Okay, I get a lower bound because W1 is positive and I get N times the integral of W1. Okay, so I'm using here both that W1 is positive and that it's integrable. Okay. And for W2, what I do is, so I keep this whole thing here, but I write it as a unique integral. Okay. So I write the whole thing as one integral by introducing the measure nu, which is the sum of delta at the points xj minus, oh, and here I forgot rho b. Oh, no, but that's because rho b is one in my proof, okay? 
so minus the background. Okay, so if you take new to be this guy and you expand this integral, you will find exactly the three terms in our energy plus the terms when j, when two points are on top of each other, which is this term here. And that's why I need W2 not to be continuous. So I need W2 at the origin to be finite. Okay, so I can write the full energy as this term minus N over two W2 of zero, which is the self interaction between my points. And the whole point is that this is now non-negative because if you write it in Fourier space, you will see it's, it's non-negative. Okay, and therefore you can only keep this. So the conclusion is that the theorem holds with integral of W1 plus W2 of zero over two. This is sometimes called linear programming bounds. And this is very much in the spirit of uh, the Kohn-Kumar way of uh, attacking the sphere packing problem. Okay, that you have the potential, you split it into short parts, long part, and then you get a linear bound in terms of it. So now you will ask me, okay, but how do I know that I can split my potential this way? And here is a very easy proof. You write one over X to the S as an average of Gaussians. Okay, you look at this integral here by scaling, it's clear that this integral is equal to a constant times one over X to the S, okay? And uh, the Gaussian is positive, uh, finite at the origin and has a positive Fourier transform. It satisfies all the good properties. And so what you do is you just truncate the integral. So there is the part when R is from zero to one, this is gonna give you W1. And the part when R is from one to infinity, this gives you W2. Okay, so it's always possible to split our potential this way. And now if you look a little bit more at the proof and uh, you, uh, be, you, you try to be a little bit more precise. So namely, you do not throw away this positive term here, but you keep it and estimate it. You will get the following result for still for S positive, that the energy is actually bounded by minus constant times N, but the positive term, this term, actually can be bounded from below by N minus uh, the, the background, uh, I mean, the number of points in the background, so rho B times the volume squared, divided by L to the S, okay? And now this tells you that you can hope the energy to be of order N only if uh, the, the background exactly corresponds to the density of points, which is very natural, okay? I mean, it's, it's very intuitive, but uh, it even tells you how fast, I mean, how good it has to be. So namely, N must be uh, the, the background, um, so rho B times the volume, plus a big O of L to the D plus S over two, if you want things to work well, namely if you want the energy to be of the order of N or of the volume. Okay, so that's an interesting lower bound, which, uh, okay, so the lower bound is valid for all N, but this is showing you that if, if it's not neutral, then the energy will be very large. Okay. So now let me uh, discuss the upper bound. So the upper bound one has to come up with the trial state. So you just put the points wherever you want and then you get an upper bound. This usually depends on the shape of omega and it might depend on S and it turns out to be not so easy, okay? So it's quite easy when S is positive because what you can do is to just take uniform IID points, okay? So you just pick all your points randomly and uniformly in your domain omega. And then the three terms will become proportional to each other and you get the following energy. Okay, you get the integral over omega squared of uh, the potential with a minus one over two n. Okay, so this integral blows up quite fast, but there is a one over n in front which compensates. And furthermore, the integral is uh, positive and with the minus sign, you deduce that the energy is always negative when S is positive. Okay, so a simple upper bound when S is positive is that E is less than zero. But this is not working good for S negative because now this has no sign or maybe it's a, it has the wrong signs depending on the situation. And uh, then it even blows up quite fast. So another idea of course is to put the points on a lattice as we did in the long range case. But if you put the points on the lattice and then you have to think that each point has this little piece of background around it, which is a cube. 
And now it is true that the interaction between two such systems will decay faster. It will actually decay like one over the distance to the S plus four, where you gain two uh, from the fact that it's locally neutral and there are some symmetries. Sorry, you get you gain four four powers. Okay, so putting the points on the lattice, cubic or whatever, is going to be bad when s is less than d minus four. It's not going to work good. Okay, so for negative s and some dimension, it's not good. So be, the best way to do the upper bound is actually to take your domain omega and split it into uh, some small subsets. So you tile it. Uh, so you split it as a union of some omega j's, all of the same volume. And then you put the points uniformly distributed in each of these omega j's, and you end up with the following bound. And then if your omega j's are not too crazy, for instance, they have a uniformly bounded diameter, then you get the expected bound constant times n. And it turns out that for a smooth domain, it's always possible to find such omega j's, and it's been proved only recently by uh, Gigante and Leopard. Okay, so anyway, you should just retain that uh, it's possible to prove uh, upper bounds. It's a little bit more complicated. We might need uh, assumptions on the domain when S is negative, although for S positive, then the energy is just negative. So now comes the, the thermodynamic limit. So the fact that the energy per unit volume converges. And so I'm stating two theorems. So if you look at the canonical problem, so let me remind you that canonical is when we fix the number of points, we take it proportional to the volume, okay? Uh, then we, we can deal with a certain range of S. And there is a grand canonical problem, which is when we look at the Legendre transform. So we also minimize over N, introducing a parameter mu, which is called the chemical potential. And this, you see, we can only do when S is positive. And the reason is that uh, the energy is behaving very badly if it's not neutral, okay? So there's just one N which is good for all the other Ns, it's very bad. And then grand canonical doesn't quite mean anything when S is a negative or zero. Okay, so there is then a, a limit uh, when uh, you fix uh, N and a limit when you, you fix mu. So let's go through the theorems. So uh, the limit when uh, you fix the density, so you fix N, has only been proved so far for S bigger than D minus two. Okay, and moreover, S can be zero, but S must be a uh, non-negative. Okay, so in dimension one, it's S uh, between zero and one. Dimension two is S between zero and two. And then dimension three, it's S between one and three, and so on and so forth. In dimension one, we can also allow S equals minus one, which is the Coulomb case. And then the theorem is a little bit uh, the same as uh, what it was in the, in the short French case, namely that the energy, the minimal energy per unit volume converges. And you see that I'm using the same name for the constant. I'm calling it E of S for a reason that you will see in the next slide. And then the, the behavior in rho has to be rho to the one plus S over D again by scale. And let me emphasize that rho, which is the limit of n over l to the d, is taken equal to the rho b. Okay, so I'm really choosing the background to uh, really uh, compensate the charges. So I'm taking rho equals rho b, the background, and then n over the volume is rho. Uh, at s equals zero, there's an additional rho of rho term, but this is just, again, a scaling thing because here you have just rho. And then I want to emphasize here that uh, maybe I should show you, I don't know where it is, maybe 15, let's see, no. So maybe I should show you again the similar theorem in the grand canonical case, the it is, okay? Uh, sorry, in the short range case. So the, we had the same limit, okay? When S is bigger than D, we had the same limit, but there it was sufficient to assume that N over the volume converges to O, okay? We assume that n over l to the d converges to rho. Now we have to assume more. We have to actually assume that n is exactly equal to rho times l to the d. Okay, we assume it's exactly neutral. And then we get the similar limit. And the reason 
is that we know that if n is not exactly neutral because of the background, it's going to behave badly. And actually there is a more precise result that if you perturb the neutral case by some number q, okay, then you will get the same, the same limit as long as the perturbation is a little o of L to the D plus S over two. Okay, and this is just because of this lemma here. We know that if N is a neutral plus L of the other D plus S over two, a big O, then the, I mean, if it's bigger, the energy is gonna be way too high. And if it's of that order, then the energy will change at uh, the order of, uh, of N. And the theorem uh, is saying that we know what is happening if Q is exactly of the order L to the D plus S over two, okay, with uh, some constant little Q, then we get the capacity again. Okay, so the, the intuition is that these uh, additional charges uh, which we are putting in the system, they have to escape to the boundary and then they solve uh, the, this capacity problem which we had on the first slide, but this uh, uh, shifts uh, the energy per unit volume by this constant. Okay, so you need to be neutral up to the order L to the D plus S over two to really get uh, the, the, the limit, otherwise you get this shift. So let me now go uh, to the grand canonical case. So then we assume that S is positive and we do the, I mean, the kind of uh, discrete Legendre transform with the parameter mu, any mu. And the theorem says that the limit of this Fs is just E of S, the rho of the background one plus S over D minus mu rho B, okay? And let me emphasize that here there's no rho. You don't know what uh, rho will be. So you put a background of density rho B and then the points, the number of points is automatic. Okay, you don't know what the number of points would be, but the theorem says that the number of points will be exactly rho B L to the D plus a little O of L to the D plus S over two. That's because of the previous theorem. This is what it has to be, okay? And so the rho of the points uh, will be rho B. Okay, it's gonna be automatically neutral up to that order. So let me emphasize that here I have a constant, which I call E grand canonical of S. And I only know that it's the same as the other constant when the first theorem is known to hold, namely when S is larger than T minus two. Okay, and then I know the two constants are the same as one expects, but uh, as you can see, there is a region, for instance, in dimension three between zero and one, uh, where uh, we know more in the grand canonical case than what we know when we fix the number of points. So another remark is that you see that mu doesn't really do anything, right? When we were, uh, working on the short range case, uh, changing mu was changing rho. Okay, that was the idea that each time I picked a mu, then I would get a rho. But here, whatever mu I take, I will al always get rho equals rho b. That's because I have this background, I have to compensate it. And mu is not going to change the density of points. The density of points has to adapt to the background I have chosen. Okay, so the intuition is probably that what mu is doing is more to uh, affect only the number of points which are close to the boundary. Okay, but certainly not the density of points in the back. Okay, so mu is not doing anything if you like, right? The density of points will be the same, whatever mu you take. Okay, so that's the result. So some references and some comments. So these theorems have been proved in the canonical and grand canonical and for the net charges by Kunz in the 1D case, Lieb Narnhofer in uh, the 3D case and Sari Merlini in all dimensions, all for Coulomb. Okay, so for S equals D minus two. Then one had to uh, wait for uh, essentially 40 years before uh, people could uh, handle the canonical risk and uh, the results I have stated are contained in works by uh, Sylvia Serfati with several people, including uh, in particular, Scott Armstrong, Thomas Leblay, uh, Mircea Petras, Nicolas Rougerie, and Etienne Sandier, as well uh, as many other people, okay? Now the risk grand canonical was actually uh, never quite stated in the literature. 
but more complicated systems have been considered, and then the proof works the same for the classical case. So more precisely, Pfefferman and Gregg in uh, the 80s, they considered the quantum grand canonical problem in a periodic background. Okay, so we have a constant background and it's classical for us. So that's even easier. In this case, uh, the, the same proof works and it's also actually easier. But that's grand canonical. And this has recently been uh, reformulated by uh, Kotar and Petrash. They re-explain and reformulate it and even change, uh, improved a little bit the method on, uh, of Hefferman and Greg in order to uh, treat a very uh, similar question. And then the fact that the grand canonical energy is equal to the canonical energy in the risk case is in my review paper. So as before, we don't know the value of the constant E, I mean the constant here, except in some cases, which I have mentioned here. So in dimension one, we know essentially everything and we get the zeta of S when S is between zero and one, zeta prime at S equals zero and minus zeta of minus one, which is one over 12, when S is minus one, okay? And in dimensions eight and 24, we get zeta of the E8 lattice and zeta of the Leach lattice uh, as shown uh, by uh, Petrash Serfati using the Kohn Kumar, Miller, Hachin, Kovyazov paper. So, here I have to be a little bit precise. So what does it mean zeta? Let me remind you that zeta, okay, is actually a function which is defined by analytic continuation in S. Okay, so zeta is just a convergent series when S is larger than the dimension. And then when S is less than the dimension, uh, you define it by analytic continuation in S. So the conclusion of all this is that inserting the background serves as doing an analytic continuation in S, okay? And this is why it's very important to first understand completely the short range case, because we expect that in the long range situation, we will get an analytic continuation of what's happening, happening on the right in the short range case, okay? So it's, it is just doing an analytic continuation in S. So that's why the background is very natural. I can now reformulate the crystallization conjecture at the level of the energy. It's the same as before. It must be zeta of some lattice at S defined by analytic continuation, where the lattice could depend on S. And in fact, in 2D, it's believed to not depend on S. It must be triangular for all S between zero and two. Okay? And, in, and by the way, at zero, it's defined by the derivative of zeta. But in 3D, there is a phase transition. It's known from numerical results that it must be the phase center cubic as it is in the short range case for S bigger or equal than three halves. And then it starts to be the body center cubic when S is below three halves. And at three halves, both lattices work. Okay, so it can really happen that the optimal lattice depends on S and then E of S is of course not analytic. It's, uh, I mean, uh, it's derivative as a jump at uh, S equals three half, but on the left and on the right side of three halves, it's an analytic function. And so for Coulomb, it must be the BCC lattice, which uh, has been predicted by Wigner in the thirties. So uh, that's the situation. So let me, very, very quickly uh, tell you uh, the main idea of the proof uh, of uh, this theorem. I'm not gonna give you the proof, it's uh, really complicated, but uh, there are really three completely different methods which I want to just uh, very quickly flash for you. So the first one is uh, the lieb nanhofer proof um, in the 70s, which is the Coulomb case. Okay, so let me remind you of uh, how we proved uh, the short range uh, similar theorem, we took a very large domain, which we tied with cube, and then in each small cube, we put the minimal positions of the points, which we repeat. And then we said that the interaction between the small cubes is a small, and that was using that the potential was short range. Now, if I do the same, I have problems because first I have the background, which I have to handle, and furthermore, it's not clear at all that the interaction between the cubes will be small. 
because it's long range. So nothing is working anymore. But Lieb and Arnaufer, they used what's called Newton's theorem, or if you like a consequence of Newton, which is that if you have a radial charge distribution, which is neutral, so the integral is zero, say in a ball, then the potential outside is just exactly zero. So if you like, if you take several balls and in each ball you put a radial uh, charge distribution, which is neutral, then they won't interact at all. There's just no interaction. And so what they did was to use balls instead of cubes, okay? So they would just tile with balls. And then in each ball, they put the, the, the minimal position. They can average over rotations to make it uh, radial. And then they will kill uh, this way the interaction. Now you will tell me, of course, I cannot tile space with balls. I will have lots of empty space and it's gonna be of the order of the volume. So what they had to do was to use balls of many different sizes so, have to, so as to fill feel the missing space and somehow get a tiling which uh, almost uh, has, a, then has the correct density. Okay, so it's a little bit more complicated. So they had to uh, understand how to tile space with poles of different sizes and the way you can control the size of the radii of these poles. And they managed to prove the existence of the lim limit using this argument. By the way, this argument is due to Lieb Leibovitz in 72. And it was adapted by Liebnarnhofer in the case of the constant background three years later. This is very Coulomb type, okay? Something like that doesn't work at all if you have a S different from D minus two, okay? Or maybe it could work for D minus four, I don't know, but uh, for a general S it will not work. So recently, so there were many works by uh, Sylvia Serfati and coworkers for S between D minus two and D. And the spirit is now completely different. The idea is to restate everything in terms of the electric field. Okay, so the electric field is minus gradient of the potential. The potential is the potential generated by the points as well as the back point. And the idea is that the energy is essentially the integral of E squared. Well, not quite because actually the, the energy of uh, the, the points themselves is infinite. So one has to do some uh, regularization, but otherwise, uh, I mean, if we forget this fact, if you think that the points are a little bit smeared out, uh, then the energy is just the integral of E squared. And integral of E squared looks local. You see, I mean, if I split my domain into smaller domains, then integral of E squared just splits. So uh, what they did was to really use some PDE methods in the way that they studied how the problem depends on E when you change the boundary conditions for E, okay? And changing the boundary conditions allows you to easily put some pieces of E together or maybe modify E. And that's the way they managed to show that you can kill the interactions between small cubes in a large domain. So I have to mention that my electric field thing is really Coulomb, okay? But there is a generalization to uh, any S, uh, which is this uh, caffarelli sylvestre uh, formulation, which is that the E, if you work in dimension D plus one, so you add one dimension, then there is a field E, E tilde, if you like, but it solves this equation. But uh, then it's similar in spirit, but it's the fact that they rely on this formulation uh, which implies that they are stuck at D minus two and can only handle S between D minus two and D. Let me emphasize that if you look at these papers, you might not recognize uh, the, the problem I formulated because they always work in, with general external potentials, okay? However, what they do works also if you do the simpler uh, thermodynamic limit, which I have stated, which corresponds to taking a potential which is infinite outside of omega and then has this form here. Let me show you again, this form here. So this term, this special form here inside of omega. But they actually look at any potential. This generates some difficulties in particular because then you first have to solve a macroscopic problem. And that's a problem we do not have in the homogeneous case. Finally, let me very quickly flash this uh, Feferman Greg inequalities. Actually, I would like to uh, make some advertisement for a simpler inequality, the Graf Schenker inequality. 
So it's a completely different spirit. So instead of constructing a trial state, which gives you an upper bound, what you do is you take the minimizer of the full domain omega and you try to split it into subdomains. But what you do is you optimize over the tiling. Okay, so you try to find the best way of uh, splitting omega so as to get the smallest interactions between the pieces. And there is a famous inequality by uh, Graf and Schenker, which tells you that if you take a tiling of R3 made of uh, only tetrahedra of side length L, then you can kill completely the interaction between uh, the, the subsystems up to an error of the other N over N. Okay, so when L is large, this is zero. And um, so that's the kind of inequality. So what you do now is you optimize about uh, on the way that you split a big domain. And then Pfefferman and Greg did the same actually before, except that they split space into cubes and the cubes into balls of many different sizes. It's much more complicated. So the reason that it is a, a grand canonical approach is that you start with a big domain omega, which you split into many small domains, but then in any small domain, you don't know how many points there, there are in this small domain. And so naturally, you have to optimize over the number of points, and that's why it's a method which works much better in the grand canonical setting. Okay, so if we follow the, the same strategy as uh, in the short range case, the next step is to prove that the points are not too close to each other and not too far from each other, they don't leave big holes. And it's the following lemma. So the lemma says, if you like that, if you look at the points which are well inside the domain, okay, so at a finite distance from the boundary, then they have a minimal distance to each other, which depends on rho. Well, it actually depends on the rho of the background, but which is the same as uh, the rho of the points as we know. Okay, so there is a minimal distance between the points. The points cannot get too close. The proof of this result is due to Lieb uh, for Coulomb, and it was then generalized by uh, Petrash and Serfati to uh, S between D minus two and D. Okay, so this says that the points can't get too close. That's very good if you want to use some compactness argument and pass to the limit. Now we would also would like to show there is no empty space because if you pass through the limit and you get nothing, or if you only get finitely many points, it's not good. And uh, this happens to be only known for Coulomb and not for Ries. So there is a preliminary result by Petrash and Rotanodari for Ries, but it doesn't cover all the cases. Okay, so there is a problem. Somehow if you take the limit, it could happen, although it's very unlikely and I'm sure it would not happen, but it could happen that you get no points or you only get finitely many points, but we want to get infinitely many points. So however, one can, what one can show very easily is that almost everywhere in the bulk, okay, so for almost every center that you pick, you will see density rho. So this I wrote in my paper, and it's an easy argument. So essentially, by choosing a good center, you know that you will have infinitely many points and you know that the points will not be too close to each other. So you can pass to the limit and get an infinite equilibrium configuration of points. Now we have a problem that knowing the distance and knowing the, that they have no big hole is not enough to give a meaning to the potential. Okay, because we would like this potential here, this phi to exist, and this phi will appear in the equilibrium equation because you remember that I will say that I am a local minimizer of the energy in the sense that if I only modify the points in a domain, uh, then the energy has to go up. But of course, these points in a domain have to interact with the points outside of the domain and I have infinitely many such points. Okay, so I have to be able to define the potential. And uh, it's something which uh, I think was not really uh, discussed in the literature. And that's what you need to be able to uh, define equilibrium uh, configurations. So I actually managed to do it in my paper, but only when S is uh, both positive and between D minus two and D. Okay, so S between zero and D in dimension one, two, and S between D minus two and D in dimension three and higher. And I managed to do it for the grand canonical problem, 
Remember that grand canonically, we have more information because we know what is happening. If we remove one point or add one point, we know the energy has to go up by at least new or down. And this gives very useful information. So I managed to show that the potential, okay? So I'm looking at any point X and I'm looking at the potential generated by the whole system. The system contains the points as well as the background. And of course the two terms will diverge very fast, okay? And I managed to show that there is some compensation. They have to compensate and the limit exists, okay? And converges to some phi and uh, locally uniformly, okay? I have a formula for this phi when S is bigger than D minus two. And here is the formula, okay? So phi is a constant plus, uh, if you like, this shifted by a constant, okay? Or even by a linear function, okay? So here I'm doing a kind of Taylor expansion of phi to make the series convergent, okay? So I take at one over x minus x j to the s, and then I remove the same thing at one point. I chose here to remove at the point x j zero in the system, okay? And this term is in gray here, because when S is between D minus one and two, this gray term actually is convergent alone and sums to zero. So I can put it or not put it as you like. Okay, so when S is bigger than D minus one, then the first series is convergent, the second as well, but it's zero, so I can remove it. And this is what people call the move function. So somehow it expresses phi in terms of its gradient, if you like. When S is D minus one or less, then I need to add this term. And you see, it's a little bit strange what we are doing because we are not shifting phi by a constant, but by a linear term because the compensation here depends on X, okay? So anyway, so this is the way that the potential gets renormalized in the limit by uh, this kind of Taylor expansion, which makes it finite. In the Coulomb case, this sum is not necessarily finite, except if there are some compensations, but I cannot show that it's the case. However, I can characterize phi by a PDE. So if you like by a Poisson's equation that the Laplace of phi must be equal to what we think. Okay, so it's a distributional solution to this equation in actually uh, L1 uniform. Okay, and I can show that solutions of this equation are actually unique up to a cost. And once the potential has been properly defined, then uh, we can give a meaning of uh, what it is to be a local minimizer of the energy. Namely, if you take a ball and you vary the positions as well as the number of points in the ball, then the energy must go up, okay? So the, the points in a ball have to minimize this problem, where here I see the potential, which is generated by the points as well as the background, outside of the ball, okay? So it's just phi minus the points inside and the background. Okay, so it's exactly the same theorem as, the, as in the short range case, except that defining the potential, so the interaction between the points is now difficult because we only get uh, divergent series and we have to show that these series get uh, renormalized, if you like, automatically, which is what I proved in uh, this theorem. The crystallization conjecture is that all such equilibrium configurations are lattices, and I don't think it's been proved in uh, any case, except maybe when S is minus one in 1D, but uh, then my theorem doesn't hold in this case. Okay, so I hope you've seen that uh, the potential is defined only up to a constant which may seem very unnatural because you think that you must know what phi is. Actually, you think that phi must be given by this limit, right? This I cannot show. So I cannot show that I can invert uh, the, the limit uh, uh, with, the, with the thermodynamic limit. So maybe I should emphasize this more. So I start with a big domain, okay? And my phi is given by this difference here, but once I pass through the limit, it's unclear that the limiting phi will satisfy this equation because it's about exchanging two limits and this I cannot prove. I expect it to be true, but I cannot prove it. So I can only prove this expression for phi. 
And anyway, you see that phi is only known to a constant, which sounds very strange. A constant we would play no role if you fix the number of points, but in the grand canonical case, changing phi by a constant is the same as changing mu. And so it's a little bit strange. But actually there is a conjecture from the, from the 80s, which says that probably if you fix a given uh, formula for phi, so say you fix this uh, without the constant C in front, then there will uh, be solutions to the previous equation. So there will be infinite equilibrium uh, configurations only for one mu. Okay, so if phi has a fixed form, then there is a solution for one mu, let's call it mu star. But uh, the theorem was saying that the limit was existing for all mu, but with phi up to a constant. So what is expected is that if you start with the wrong mu, then phi will pick a constant which will change mu into mu star. Okay, so it's all about renormalization here and uh, the way that the chemical potential gets renormalized automatically due to screening in this uh, classical uh, statistical mechanical problem. But this is all over. Anyway, you see that our phi is only defined up to a constant. And it could also be that the constant depends on the way that you renormalize phi. There are several natural ways of renormalizing the potential. So you can look at this limit, which sounds the most natural. But you can also look at analytic extension, because this is what we think should uh, happen most of the time. Or you can look at the move function to a kind of Taylor expansion as I did here. And uh, it's unclear whether they all work or whether they coincide, whether they coincide up to a constant if you give me an, infinitely, an infinite collection of points. And that's the last thing which I would like to uh, discuss in the remaining uh, 12 minutes or so or 13. Let me forget now this uh, equilibrium configuration. So the one that I get uh, from, this, uh, from this thermodynamic limit. And let me discuss what I can say about the potential phi for general infinite configurations, in particular for lattices. And I will tell you that it's actually very complicated. So it's not a surprise that in this case where we don't know what the XJs are, then we don't quite know what the constant is. So this is going to be the last part of this talk. What can we say about the long range potential of an infinite configuration of points, any infinite configuration of points, or maybe more precisely lattices? So, and this is very important and it's a problem which has reappeared many times in the physical literature. I was even part of it at some point. So, uh, it seems that uh, in, in 59, it was noted uh, by Plasquet that there was a difficulty. And this was then rediscovered by Hall in 79. So he wrote uh, a paper which uh, generated a lot of discussion in the physical literature that there was a problem in the fam famous computation of uh, the energy of the BCC lattice by Wigner and Fuchs in the 30s because of, uh, of a constant which was floating around. And then it was discussed in many papers and the conclusion was that, uh, was, was that it's difficult. It was rediscovered one year later without any mention of the paper by Hall, by Schocker, Favre, and Gruber, who uh, noticed that several definitions of the pressure were non-equivalent when there is a uniform background. And then it was discovered once more by Borwein and co-workers who found some jump discontinuities in this kind of potentials for lattices in 88. And then with uh, Elliot Lee, when we were working on the, um, on the local density approximation, uh, or more say on the Lee Boxford inequality uh, in density functional theory, when reading Borwein, we had problems comparing two models because of the same jump discontinuity but we didn't know about the earlier paper. So you see, it's a problem which reappears uh, frequently in the physical literature. And uh, it's really about defining the, the potential of an infinite configuration of points with the background and the fact that it's actually not well defined, even for a lattice. So let me explain this problem. Okay, 
So let me take an infinite configuration of points in RD. Okay, I will assume that the points do not get too close. Okay, so I have infinitely many points. Okay, and now I would like to know, so I can look at the potential. And the question I'm asking is what property of these points do I need to make sure that if I do an analytic continuation, I get the same as if I put a uniform background. So the first question you will ask me is, okay, but which background I have no density. So let me assume that the points have a density. So namely, if I take the ball of, ra of, radio of radius R centered at some X, okay, let me assume that the number of points behaves like rho times the volume of that ball up to an error. And I will assume that the error is uniform. It's an R to the power D minus alpha for some positive alpha. Okay, so this is saying that I have infinitely many points. And then if I compute the number of points per unit volume in large poles, uh, then I find rho with an error, which is of exactly that order. Okay, then the lemma says that if I look at the potential, okay, so here is the potential of my points. And I look at this potential for S bigger than D, then this potential admits a meromorphic extension to S bigger than D minus alpha, where alpha is the alpha here in the estimate, okay? With a unique simple pole at S equals D. And the analytic extension is the same as if you put a background. Okay, so this is saying that under this assumption on the points, then two natural ways of renormalizing the potential, namely analytic continuation and background, give the same answer. However, you see that the range of S is quite small. It depends on this alpha. And for general uh, configuration of points, it's not so easy to know what's the best alpha. Actually, in many cases, there is there are conjecture. Okay, that's a small lemma. It's very easy to prove. It was inspired by these papers. You will find the proof in my review. It's just a few lines. But uh, what I like here is really that it gives you uh, the, the, the coincidence of two different ways of renormalizing the divergent potential of an infinite configuration of points and background is the same as analytic continuation. This lemma is optimal. So if you have a, a configuration of points which re, for which really you get D minus alpha and it's optimal, then you can actually create a pole. I can construct an example, create a pole exactly at D minus alpha. So the range of S is optimal. And for periodic systems, so for lattices, it's actually a very famous conjecture of finding the best alpha and it depends on the dimension. Okay, so it's expected that alpha equals two should work in all dimensions but one. Okay, in dimension one, it's of course alpha equals one. But it's only been proved by Goetze in 2004 in dimension five and higher. Okay, and then in lower dimensions, things get worse. And that's the kind of alpha that you can put. Okay, so you see that if you expect alpha equals two, then you get D minus two. And so you hope to exactly to exactly not reach the Coulomb case for, for a lattice. Okay, but nevertheless, it's a general lemma. It applies to uh, all kinds of uh, distribution of points as soon as they satisfy this property. So for a lattice, it's not a very good lemma. So what can we say for a lattice? So let me give you now a slightly more complicated lemma. So let me take again an infinite configuration of points. And let me assume that I can split my space into uh, infinitely many disjoint subsets, omega j, okay, which are so that they contain only one point and they all have the same volume and uh, the, the, uh, the, if you like, the dipole vanishes. Okay, so let me assume that I am in this situation and that's exactly what you have for a lattice, okay, for a lattice. You have uh, points on the lattice, and then for omega j, you can take just the unit cell of the lattice, and you get exactly these properties. And then 
uh, you get the same theorem as before, except that now you can go to D minus two in all dimensions. Okay, so by putting these small local properties, uh, you are able to go until D minus two, not including. So the theorem says that the potential, which you define initially for S bigger than D as a meromorphic extension with a unique simple polar S equals D, and below it is given by uh, the background. Okay, so let me mention that here, I'm taking a very specific way of going uh, the background. So I take a large pole, I take the points in a ball, and then I take not the background being the ball, but I take the union of the omega j's for the egg j's in the ball. Okay, and in this case, inserting the background is the same as doing an analytic continuation. So again, we have two equivalent ways of renormalizing our potential. And this works for lattices in all dimensions now. So we can conclude that for a lattice, okay, in any dimension, uh, then we know that the background works and does the same as an analytic continuation if you want to define the potential. But we seem to be stuck at D minus two. And there is a reason for that. It, and it's this, uh, this controversy, the, which I mentioned in the physical literature, that actually at D minus two, things do not work. Okay, so let me state this, and it's really due to uh, Borwein et al. in 88. So let me take a, a Bravais lattice. So X is now a Bravais lattice. I call Q the unit cell. Then the properties are automatic, as I told you. Okay, and then I look at the potential for S bigger than D. And then it's very well known, this is actually the Epstein uh, zeta function, essentially, more or less, that this admits a meromorphic extension to the whole plane, not only uh, for S bigger than D minus two, but to actually the whole plane, the whole complex plane, except S equals D, where there is a simple pole. Okay, so if you speak about analytic extension, uh, then the, you can reach any S any very negative S, uh, of course, except S equals D, which is always special, okay? And then if you assume furthermore that there's no quadripole in this, uh, I mean, in this way, okay? Then at S equals D minus two, uh, the background, the limit for the background exists. Okay, so the limit for the background exists but it doesn't do what it should do. Okay, so the limit for the background is the analytic extension plus a universal shift, which doesn't depend on X, which is given by this term here. Okay, so there is a sudden jump. Okay, in the periodic case, suddenly uh, inserting a background is not something good. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't do the same as analytic extension, but it shifts the potential by a constant Okay, and this is the explanation for this uh, controversy in the, in the physical literature. Okay, so you see that the conclusion is that for a lattice, computing uh, the, the potential generated by an infinite configuration of points is not easy. It depends on the way you're, gonna to you're going to compute it. If you define it by analytic extension, you will not get the same as if you define it with a background. And actually, I was only looking at one very special way of making the background grow. And uh, Nish Power and Rieskrock, they argued that by choosing some different ways, you can actually change this constant. So the conclusion is that there's no unique way of defining the potential of an infinite configuration of points using the background or maybe also using analytic extension, these ways they will all differ by a constant, okay? And this is perhaps not a surprise if uh, we think in terms of uh, this renormalization of the chemical potential, okay? Uh, I have one slide about the proof. I will spend maybe uh, 20 seconds and then I conclude, okay? So the proof is very easy. It's really based on, on expressing things exactly using Fourier series. Okay, so you look at uh, this thing, which uh, you can show converges for uh, 
for s larger or equal than d minus two using the quadrupole assumption, and you recognize that it's a sum of a, of some function f s of x minus h t. So if you like, it's the periodization of f sub s, where f sub s is this function here. Okay. And now what can you say about this periodic function? Well, let me compute the Fourier coefficients. The Fourier coefficients are actually proportional to one minus the Fourier transform of uh, the characteristic function of the unit cell divided by k to the d minus s because that's the expression of s here, okay? And now if you compute what it is, you get one over k to the d minus s when k is non-zero and you get zero when k is zero and s is strictly less than d minus two, okay? But when you are at d minus two, suddenly the zero Fourier coefficient is not zero anymore because this difference here in the numerator behaves like k squared. And when s is d minus two, the denominator is, always, is also k squared, okay? So suddenly this is not zero at k equals zero and you get this uh, shift, okay? So that's just the explanation that the Fourier coefficient at zero has a jump when uh, you go from s bigger than d minus two to s equal to d minus two. Let me conclude, it's time to finish. So we've discussed infinite optimal uh, configuration of points. Okay, we've seen that they exist, that the potential gets renormalized. And uh, the way to do that was to insert a uniform background, okay? It's a little bit unclear what the potential phi is. We know it, but only up to a constant. And we've explained that it's really complicated, this constant floating around, it has to be there. In particular for Coulomb, we know that even in the periodic case, there's always a constant floating around. Of course, there are many interesting questions, for instance, the crystallization conjecture, and many things have been done at positive temperature. I've only discussed the zero temperature case. But if you want to know more, I advise you to look uh, to take a look at my paper. And now I have to uh, to stop because I'm a little bit late. And I thank you very much for your attention.